Hello, good morning, everyone. So welcome to the first of a series of uh, great digital assets uh, events uh, hosted by Invest Hong Kong. So welcome to all the friends, uh, both in Hong Kong and overseas. Now, this is a really uh, great uh, and exciting events that I've been looking forward to. Now, but before we go, we, we go into the details, I would just like to introduce uh, some of the, the great people who have helped us to make this happen. First of all, the, this event is uh, hosted by the FinTech, as well as the family office teams at Invest Hong Kong. We all also have several uh, great support organizations that we want to thank uh, to help uh, basically invite the guests as well. And we have the Association of Family Offices in Asia, AFO, we have Family Office Association of Hong Kong, uh, the FinTech Association of Hong Kong, and Hong Kong Investment Funds Association. Now, of course, we also have uh, the great privilege to have some super knowledgeable people yeah, in Hong Kong about this topic. To start with, uh, we have our, our, our great colleague at SFC, Elizabeth Wong, the Director of Licensing and Head of FinTech Units in the Mediaries at SFC. We have uh, Alasio Gualini, CEO and Co-Founder of Hess Trust. Uh, we have our, our very respected uh, Professor uh, uh, Wang Yang, uh, Vice President at, for Institutional Advancement of uh, HKUST. And last but not least, a uh, great friend, uh, Gary, Gary Tu, uh, Managing Director, Head of Regulatory Affairs at OSL. And I'm the moderator, King Long, Head of FinTech in Hong Kong. Now, again, as I said, this is an event that is uh, long in making, that uh, we have been hearing a lot of uh, great feedback in the market. Uh, there are some misconceptions, there's some inquiries, and we, in which we feel that uh, it's important for us to hold this series of events starting with today. That there are basically two objectives that we have uh, in the next hour of sharing with you. Now, first of all, our target audience are primarily the investors, because we understand that there have been a bit of questions about investing in digital assets. So how is it, is it legal? Uh, what's the proper route to do it? How are we protect it? I mean, there's just quite a lot of questions in market that we've been hearing the, over the past few months. So we felt that we'd like to get the right uh, experts uh, to share uh, with the audience to hopefully uh, clarify some of the questions you have in mind uh, over the past uh, many months. Now, but if we take this above one more tier, we would also like to share with you our vision about how the home governments and the broader community see digital assets playing a very important role to our economy. Of course, we heard about the Web3, we, we heard about the NFTs, and we heard about, uh, I think, the infrastructure development on blockchain, of course, digital assets, but how all these things come together to contribute to our economy. So that's why we have the uh, great privilege to have Professor Wang to share the, some of his uh, great uh, thought leadership uh, views with us to, in a way, to tee off this discussion. And this is uh, definitely not the last time you hear from us about this bigger strategic macro topic. Now, without further ado, I really want to just get straight, get straight right into it. Now, uh, the first person I really want to, to pick the brain uh, would be uh, a great colleague, Elizabeth, from SFC. Now, obviously, you guys have been working like tirelessly to try to shape the, re the regulation, and you also work very closely with our uh, colleagues at HMA, uh, where you released a joint circular on the intermediaries' uh, virtual asset-related activities in late January. Now, for, of course, uh, for the organizations that are deeply into this, they probably know what's happening. But, but for the benefit for the broader audience, I think it will be very helpful that uh, we can invite Elizabeth to share with the audience about the SFC's the latest strategic direction regarding digital assets regulation, as well as what it means to digital asset investors in Hong Kong uh, in terms of investment product choices and uh, investor protection. So without further ado, uh, Elizabeth, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, King. Now, um, before I talk about the joint circular, I want to give some background on the SFC's approach to regulating the crypto space. Now, the SFC is a very firm believer that regulatory clarity can support the healthy and orderly development of the industry. So that is why the SFC was in fact one of the first leading regulators to introduce a comprehensive regulatory framework governing virtual asset activities back in 2018. Back then, we already noted that virtual assets were here to stay, so we decided it was important to provide guidance to the virtual asset industry in order for it to develop and flourish. Hence, we took a very proactive approach and in 2019, 
we introduced a regime to regulate the most prevalent virtual asset activity, that is, the operation of a virtual asset trading platform. We stretched our jurisdiction to the maximum extent by applying our existing powers governing the securities and futures market to, govern, to also govern virtual asset trading platforms. We did this by requiring platforms interested in getting our license to offer to trade at least one security token on their platform. This way, their activities would fall within the regulatory remit of the SFC. The approach to regulation that we adopted and that we continue to use is to regulate the same business and same risk with the same rules. So in relation to virtual asset trading platforms, we noted that the business model adopted and the risk posed to investors were similar to those of securities brokers and automated trading venues. So we imposed standards and requirements based heavily on our existing requirements, which apply to securities brokers and automated trading venues. Now, by implementing this framework, a clear compliance pathway was provided for operators, which are committed to adhering to the SFC's high standards and would like to obtain our license. Fast forward three years later, this brings me to the joint circular we issued with the Hong Kong Monetary Authority in January this year. Again, we noted that another prevailing intersection of the virtual asset industry with the investing public was through traditional financial services. As with introducing a comprehensive framework back in 2018, our aim in issuing the joint circular was to provide comprehensive guidance for intermediaries who wish to provide financial services involving virtual assets so that they can operate their business with regulatory certainty. The circular makes it clear that intermediaries can now engage in certain virtual asset activities within, within their licensed entities. These activities include distribution of virtual asset related products and the provision of virtual asset dealing services and virtual asset advisory services. Regarding the distribution of virtual asset related products, the SFC differentiates between derivatives which track the value of the underlying virtual assets and products which directly invest in virtual assets. In relation to a limited suite of virtual asset related products, namely virtual asset derivatives which are traded on specified exchanges, or virtual asset futures based ETFs, which are authorized for offering to retail investors in a designated jurisdiction. We did not impose the professional investor only restriction for distributing these products, such that it would be possible for retail investors to trade in such products. Now the circular also applies the same business, same risk, same rules approach and makes it clear that virtual asset related products are generally complex products such that our existing complex product requirements would apply. As for the second part of the joint circular on provision of virtual asset dealing services, we are still concerned about the general unregulated nature of virtual assets globally. For example, as mentioned before, the SFC is one of the few jurisdictions that regulate virtual asset trading platforms. And we also are one of the few jurisdictions that regulate these platforms from an investor protection perspective, rather than merely for AML purposes. So this is why we only permit intermediaries to partner with SFC licensed virtual exchanges. And these exchanges, um, these intermediaries may only provide um, the services to existing professional investor clients. As for the SFC's current and upcoming work in the virtual asset space, we are currently working with the government on um, proposed amendments to the anti-money laundering ordinance. Um, through these amendments, we are introducing a licensing and regulatory regime governing centralized virtual asset exchanges trading non-security non tokens in Hong Kong. So upon commencement of this new regime, all centralized virtual asset exchanges in Hong Kong will be required to be licensed and supervised by the SFC. Now to implement the new regime, the SFC will conduct a public consultation on the regulatory requirements to be imposed. We expect that the requirements under the new regime will be substantially similar to the existing regime and would cover areas such as safe custody of client assets, anti-money laundering, market surveillance, and mission of virtual assets for trading and cybersecurity. Um, going forward, and which we continue to do, um, we will continue to closely monitor the latest developments in the virtual asset space. And we will continuously revisit our regulatory approach whenever it is necessary in order to continue to provide regulatory clarity to the industry, facilitate the industry to develop in an orderly and healthy way, and um, also provide investors with better outcomes. So this is basically the um, direction that the SFC is taking in relation to virtual asset regulation.
Great. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of uh, the, uh, the guests are online. Uh, you might have uh, further questions. And if you do, uh, don't be shy. You can uh, send in your comments or questions in the chat function. We'll try to get into it. Uh, we we'll save some time towards the end uh, for Q&A. Now, without further ado, uh, perhaps we can just write on this momentum about the regulation. Uh, the next person we really want to uh, tap into will be uh, Gary. Now, Gary, I understand that uh, your team has been working very hard in, uh, of course, not just looking at Hong Kong regulation, but also looking across many other jurisdictions, I think like eight or, or more of those uh, markets that you look at. Now, obviously, so now that you have this more sort of broader macro view, are you able to share with the audience about, uh, from your uh, perspective as an industry practitioner? So one of the things that uh, Hong Kong has done well and things that uh, you might want to sort of suggest uh, from a regulatory perspective going forward so that you can foster and more vibrant uh, digital assets uh, environments. So uh, any thoughts, uh, Gary? Thank you, King. Um, I, I think globally, um, the, the Hong Kong journey, if we look at sort of the Hong Kong journey in embracing digital assets, um, I, I think uh, glo globally, we, you know, as, a, as an ecosystem, we are very much still in the early rounds. Um, I think if we, if we sort of do a, do, do a, um, a survey of the of the key achievements um, and maybe some of the development areas. Maybe, maybe we'll start start up with the achievements because I, I think that they are actually they're actually very material ones. So, um, if we want to sort of look at the achievements of the Hong Kong regime, first of all, I think we definitely want to look at the quality of the regulatory regime. Secondly, the ability of the regulatory regime to connect with the rest of the financial ecosystem. Um, and thirdly, I would say. Um, also, the um, whether we have provided uh, a live training environment for all the support infrastructure that needs to go with the maturity of the digital asset ecosystem. So, if we go through sort of the three points, um, the quality of the regime, without a doubt, um, everything that that um, Elizabeth has just mentioned, I would agree with. The the comprehens comprehensiveness of the Hong Kong regime is is without question, um, and. Um, and I think as evidence um, uh, of the quality, I think we are starting to see more and more traces of the Hong Kong regime making its way into other developing regimes. So, so for example, the Australian Treasury uh, consultation um, to, to look at crypto asset regulation, um, we, we distinctively see traces of, of, of the Hong Kong approach. Um, and for example, um, Singapore's um, approach to, to digital payment token regulation as well. We see, we see a drift um, over the last two or three years um, uh, and, and, it's, and, and it's a drift upwards in terms of um, pushing the standards up uh, for investor protection as well as protecting orderly markets. And, um, and, and, we see, uh, and we see other similar approaches being taken by regulators such as, such as you know, for example, the FCA in the UK as well. So I think the quality of the regime is, is without question. Um, so on the second point, the ability to connect with financial ecosystems, and once again, um, thank you, Elizabeth, for, for, for explaining the joint circular to us, because that, that to me is, is, is indeed actually a very, very material development for Hong Kong and, inter and for the international digital asset community. It is not just a high-level um, philosophical statement about connecting the two, about connecting traditional finance with digital, with di digital assets. It is actually a blueprint. It is actually... Um, a, a set of very specific requirements to tell brokers and private banks and financial advisors how to enter the space, how to run a revenue generating business in that space. And that, that degree of certainty and clarity is actually quite unique. And, and, and I think definitely one of, the, one of the major achievements for the Hong Kong um, um, regulatory story. And I think on the live, live training environment part as well, which, is my, which was my point number three, um, you know, the Hong Kong regime is now a uh, little, little bit over three years old. Um, the, the first uh, license granted um, is now about 18 months old. Um, and and we've, just seen, we've just seen a second approval in principle uh, uh, announced a few days ago. Um, so, um, and when, you know, what are we talking about when, when we want to talk about the support infrastructure? We're talking about all the lawyers, risk managers, compliance professionals, um, and um, uh, accountants, uh, auditors, as well as regulators and banks, all the people that need to make um, uh, that, that need to go along with the journey to make the system work. So I think you know Hong Kong uh, once again I think is unique in that respect. We've had three years of live training environment, 
for all the banks learning how to connect with with digital assets or the auditors knowing how to know, knowing what are the controls they need to look out for so so I, I think that that's that's definitely a part of the part of the achievements we we, we shouldn't ignore but on on the development side and 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 I'll, I'll I'll keep it short as well um you know I'll make it three points that would be my theme for the day so on, on the development side I think um you know as a question of fact the current licensing regime is still voluntary that is a fact that 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 still remains current to this day. So what, what we have in Hong Kong at the moment is still a two track marketplace, a very orderly one with um, a very small number of participants. And then, you know, I, I guess if we if we had to give a label, there is still a sort of a wild jungle um, side to, to the Hong Kong digital asset ecosystem, which is still very much alive albeit shrinking very rapidly. And, and, and I think, you know, with, with, the, with the mandatory licensing um, coming in, obviously that, that will naturally um, be, become a remnant of history. But to this day, at the moment, we, we, still, see, we still see the two track. Second development area uh, or, or observation, we have to admit um, the maturity of the regulated part of the digital asset ecosystem in Hong Kong is still very much hampered by regulatory arbitrage. That's just a fact of life. Um, but once again, you know, we, we, we see light at the end of the tunnel, or, or, or I guess if we sort of you know, turn around, we see the end of the tunnel, um, uh, you know, fast approaching. And as a last observation on, on sort of the develop, uh, uh, developing areas, um, you know, because I think largely because of the two track system, we are seeing, in my personal view, far less international attention on the Hong Kong regime as a proof of concept than it truly deserves. Um, you know, as, as the old anecdote from the financial markets uh, always says, liquidity brings liquidity. In the fintech space, critical mass brings critical mass. And innovation, innovation comes with critical mass. And innovation and capital also come with critical mass. So that, that is one aspect that, that we do have to take heed if we want um, to, to foster the continuing maturity of the Hong Kong regulated digital asset ecosystem. Great, uh, a lot to unpack, uh, but thank you so much for sharing the thoughts. I'm sure you've been thinking about this yeah, every night in the past of many years, Gary. Now, I'd like, I'd like to change gear uh, quickly to uh, last year. So obviously you guys are a um, early mover into the digital assets custodian space, and you've been serving many you know, uh, you know, institutional and professional investors. So can you share with the audience about what are the most common services to provide to your clients? Sure, well, thanks for your question. Um, so first of all, just uh, just to clarify, um, our, our services and platform uh, are directed to institutional investors. Uh, and that's really, so we uh, basically operate in the B2B space. Um, now, really to summarize the types of services that we, that we provide, let me basically uh, divide our client base into two main categories, even though, I mean, there will be a lot of over, uh, overlaps. But so the first category is really the, the service providers. Right, so um, the service providers are basically all those companies that utilize our services to then provide digital asset, ser digital asset services to the end uh, clients. Uh, so the, usually they come to us for our platform, they come for us uh, for custody. Right? What this means is that basically we operate our business as a either as a custodian Right, where we basically provide a financial financial service to them, or as a software company where we provide a software platform, which basically has more or less the same characteristics of the service we provide, without the fact that we take the financial risk in the uh, in the in the service that we provide. The, the the type of services that they need is obviously yes, it starts with the safekeeping of the assets. Right, so we know. Uh, as a fact, as of today, how important it is to safe keep the digital assets and make sure that, that they're not hackable. But at the same time, they're also available uh, to be used when they are needed uh, by, by our clients. But then that, that is just the beginning. Then there is a lot of back office activities that, uh, that actually go on and that we need to provide. Say, for example, uh, the reporting, tax reporting, regulatory reporting, or all the compliance services that, uh, I mean, today have become uh, so critical for uh, digital asset service providers in the industry, such as AML, CTF, and real-time transaction monitoring. 
Um, but this is just kind of the, the first step. Now cli uh, clients that look for uh, digital asset platforms that have become more sophisticated and the safekeeping is not enough. So usually what they would request uh, are additional services, usually on-chain services uh, such as uh, staking or delegation of tokens uh, to validators nodes for uh, POS blockchain networks, as well as other services, for example, governance services. Now the, the blockchains are becoming more decentralized and hence require token holders to actually express their uh, rights to vote. Right? And the role of the custodian is actually also to give access to this kind of uh, uh, this kind of services, but also more um, complex services. So for example, wrapping and unwrapping tokens that have to be transferred from one blockchain to another blockchain. Now, moving to the other category of clients, the second category, uh, I will call them end investors. And these are basically um, either corporate clients, uh, family offices, or buy side hedge funds, asset managers. So usually these clients, they do come uh, to us for custody, but actually what they need is more of a uh, prime brokerage type of service. Right? So they need somebody to safe keep their assets, but at the same time, they also look for a platform where they can trade their assets, right? uh, somebody that can do provide market making services for the assets somebody that can provide leverage by lending against their assets that are held as, as collateral, uh, somebody that can provide yield uh, for their assets that are held in custody, as well as obviously as all the on-chain services that we, uh, that we mentioned before, uh, staking delegation, et cetera. So I would say this, these, are really the, uh, these are really the two categories uh, of clients that, that we're seeing. And obviously uh, the, the other category is banks, that are progressively entering the market uh, step by step. And uh, depending on the type of bank um, that comes to us, uh, they might require more of a software platform if, if they want to become custodian for digital assets themselves or a custody service if they're willing to appoint a self-custodian. Well, this is uh, fabulous. Uh, I guess uh, this is something that uh, for those who are not in the space, it is definitely a good uh, place to know that uh, hash trust is there to uh, safeguard your assets. Uh, well, it's through your through your uh, you know funds and, and also the family offices and so forth. Now, um, I gotta, I'd like to uh, now uh, invite uh, Professor Wang to help us. Uh, I guess uh, now after we talk about some very important and also practical, you know, things from regulations to uh, where Hong Kong really stand. Uh, as well as you know, services that me, if I were the investor, how can and who are out there to save, safeguard my assets. So, but then there are also like a bigger topic that uh, Professor Wen, you and I talk about that's very dear into your heart. So can you really share with the audience about uh, your view about the white paper that you are now developing? They are really charting the roadmap for the digital economy for Hong Kong and the broader, the broader, the broader context. So that, uh, Professor Wang, uh, off to you. Uh, thank you, King. Actually, uh, uh, so, so, so I, I like to expand on this topic from uh, three angles. Uh, mainly, you know, the question is why we, you know, we have to, to promote and develop digital economy in Hong Kong. Okay? So the first angle is very easy to understand. So digital economy will be the next major pillar for Hong Kong's economy. In fact, it's already shaping up to be the next economic pillar for the rest of, for the world. Okay. So digital economy is the actually the fastest growing uh, economic sector in the world. A uh, various surveys have shown that it's growing at a really a breakneck speed. Okay. So uh, so in this particular regard, it will not be surprising to see that the digital uh, in economy, in particular, what I'm focused on is a pure digital economy. The digital industrialization has become more than, say, 40% of the world economy in the next 25, 30 years. Okay. So uh, the other angle we can look at is uh, China is already actively positioning itself to be the world leader in digital economy. Uh, in fact, the 14th uh, five year plan has spelled out a roadmap for China to develop its economy and to become a leader in digital economy. 
So it will be a, a major pillar, economic pillar in China. And it will also, from this point of uh, view, uh, a major economic driver for Hong Kong. I actually cannot see a better economic driver for Hong Kong. So we have been once viewed as a leader and the most vibrant, uh, innovative place for digital assets. And now, unfortunately, due to uh, reasons we, that have been articulated by, um, uh, by others uh, in this panel, uh, that we're losing that reputation to some other countries, in particular, Singapore and Dubai. Okay, so this is the 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 uh, the angle from uh, you know the major economic pillar. The second angle I want to focus on is to uh, really uh, to make Hong Kong the future focal point and hub for innovation. Okay, and to regain the vibrance the city once had not long ago. And I do not believe there is a better driver, as I said, from uh, by in, for Hong Kong to invest in digital infrastructure and developing uh, digital economy. Okay? So um, you, you know, if you look at what the government has done, we have been very committed to developing Hong Kong into a hub for technology innovation. Okay? So there is uh, this uh, Inno Hong Kong centers in Science Park where the government has funded more than 20 Inno Hong Kong centers giving each about 500 million Hong Kong dollars. Okay? And uh, the technology focus uh, were are on biotechnology, robotics, and uh, semiconductor. Okay, uh, but I think under our very eyes we have this new um, economic pillar and this fast-growing area of the digital economy. Unfortunately, the government has not made the same kind of investment it has made in other parts. And I actually have uh, quite a bit misgivings about the way it's uh, the our innovation drive has been conducted. You know, I think uh, the uh, we have somehow uh, neglected giving a significant amount of investment to developing digital infrastructure and developing policy that lay out the foundation for the future digital economy growth. Okay, so that's uh, from this point on, I, I like to, uh, I, uh, this, this, well, this is the second part. Okay, so the third um, angle I want to focus on is, uh, despite the enviable wealth compared to much of the rest of the world, Hong Kong is also a world leader in economic polarization and inequality. Where young people today often feel being left out or worse, being a victim of highly skilled economic development. Okay. Digital economy is at a crossroad where new business model powered by the latest blockchain technologies today are actually attempting to create a more equal econ economic opportunity, uh, in particular under the Web 3.0 framework. Okay. So, uh, Many of us remember, for example, the day of a Walmart. You know, I, I was in the U.S. about in the you know for thirty years, and in the, I remember in the late nineteen nineties, uh, we we see Walmart driving out the small businesses, creating this so-called Walmart effect. So when Amazon came, you know. Uh, came to, to the view, uh, many people applauded saying, well, this is something will counterbalance the, you know, the monopoly, uh, monopolistic uh, practices of Walmart. Well, little we know that Amazon today uh, has become the new, symbolized the new monopoly, okay? And uh, so, of course, in Hong Kong, we don't have these monopolistic, I mean, we're at least we're not the center of the monopolistic platforms, uh, internet 2.0 monopolistic platform. However, we have other forms of, uh, of monopolies. In fact, we are, uh, our economic pillar so far has been a monopolizing real estate market, okay? And Hong Kong now is one of the most polarizing societies, as I said, economically. So now there are growing calls for more sustainable, inclusive and equitable economic government. So what is the best way to do it? Okay. And in my view, that pathway for to address the economic inequality is through digital economy. In fact, under the web 3.0 ecosystem, uh, you know, we see much more uh, vibrant engagement in economic activities in other parts of the world. I can list some places like Vietnam, Philippines, and uh, other places, Singapore as well. Okay, so so this to me is 
definitely a pathway we should not ignore. Okay? And from that point of view, you know, even China is leading the charge in calling for economic, for common prosperity. Okay, so uh, uh, if you read the the fourteenth five year plan, uh, it actually is a very key part. Okay, so uh, here I believe Hong Kong should be at the forefront to answer the call. And again, let me just say, there's no better pathway than developing its digital economy to uh, for more econ for a more sustainable and equitable economic development. Great. <laughs> well, thank you uh, for sharing, Professor Wang. Again, uh, some of the, the pain points that you pointed out are things that uh, we are aware and we are committed to, to deal with them. Of course, I think it's going to be very helpful to get some uh, sort of uh, guidance, right, in terms of uh, like where we search, like data-driven, fact, back uh, paper that, that we are looking forward to uh, seeing from, from, your, from, your, from your from your research team. So that that would be another great roadmap for us to uh, take on to the new Web3 world. Now, um, I, I'd like to uh, go back to Elizabeth because now obviously the, a lot of times when we think about this the grand vision for so taking Hong Kong to the next level of digital economy, uh, mm -hmm. digital economy developments, we need uh, the smart money. This is, this is uh, where a lot of times, this is where a lot of activities start. Now, and among the, the, the people that we got the privilege to talk to, you know, various investors, the FEM offices, you know, the corporate venture funds and whatnot, you know, there have been some questions around setting up crypto funds or, or issuing like NFTs or what would that be like an NFT funds kind of regime. And so there've been a, a bit of inquiries we've, we've been hearing in the market. So can you share with the audience about uh, SFC's uh, regulatory approach in regulating uh, private crypto funds. And as a, as a part two, uh, as a follow on, is what's your view about uh, the ongoing development of NFTs from a regulatory perspective? Right, now in relation to your first question, in relation to regulating private crypto funds, I would really like to take this opportunity to clarify one big misconception, which I've heard in the industry many, many times. Now the SFC does not regulate private funds. We, for example, we do not regulate the investment strategy or the assets that a private fund would actually invest into. Um, the SFC's regulatory approach and handle has always been and is on the conduct of licensed fund managers and not the private fund itself. So um, in relation to um, virtual asset funds, we published detailed guidance on the conduct requirements expected of fund managers managing such funds in 2018 and 2019. Now, um, in that um, guidance, we again applied the same business, same risk, same rules approach. So fund managers managing virtual assets funds are required to comply with existing regulatory requirements, such as the fund manager code of conduct. But we have made some adaptations of these requirements to address the specific risks associated with virtual assets. So if a fund manager approaches us and tells us that they want to invest more than 10% of its fund into virtual assets, then um, we will impose licensing conditions on their license um, in order to subject them to the adapted requirements which are tailored for um, the specific risks in relation to virtual assets. So for example, what do we require of fund managers who manage virtual asset funds? So um, in, for example, we um, to address safe custody risks, we will require them to exercise due skill, care and diligence in selecting, appointing and also monitoring custodians. Now, what does this mean? We would probably require them to consider the experience and track record of the custodian um, in relation to providing custodial services for virtual assets. Um, we would ask them to look at the regulatory status of the custodian. They should also consider um, the corporate governance structure and background of the senior management of the custodian. And also they should consider whether um, the custodian has financial resources and insurance cover to, in order to compensate customers in the event of loss of assets or, um, op or in relation to some operational capabilities of the custodian. Now, another example um, um, in relation to the adapted requirements is that we require fund managers to appoint independent auditors for the fund, um, which have the experience and capability in checking the existence and ownership and ascertaining the reasonableness of the valuation of virtual assets. So I'm sure that um, from the examples that I've given, um, these all these requirements sound very familiar as they are derived from the general principles that normally govern the conduct of fund managers 
already, um, but just with the um, slight adaptations for um, virtual assets. Now, um, in relation to your second question, um, our view on NFTs, um, the SFC notes that um, currently um, NFTs are more commonly used in the gaming industry, um, therefore um, used for art pieces, video clips, avatars, or even animations. So for these types of NFTs, which are genuinely digital representations of a collectible, such as a piece of artwork, the activities in relation to these NFTs do not fall under the remit of the SFC as these types of NFTs are unlikely um, securities under um, the SFO. Um, indeed, um, we do not set out to regulate these NFTs, just as we don't regulate, for example, fine art galleries in Hong Kong. Now, however, we have observed recent developments in the NFT space, which are starting to cross the boundary between mere collectibles and starting to go into the financial asset space. For example, there appear to be fractionalized NFTs or even fungible NFTs featuring characteristics similar to securities or in particular collective investment schemes under these um, securities and futures ordinance. So where such line is crossed, activities in these NFTs will trigger the application of securities laws and will trigger um, the SFC's regulatory remit. So um, the SFC is closely monitoring the latest developments in NFTs and um, market participants should ensure that their NFT activities do not cross into the securities markets or else our regulatory remit would kick in. So um, in general, we do not seek to regulate NFTs, but once they start crossing the line, then um, the SFC will be in touch. <laughs> Well, I, um, I guess that's the kind of coffee calls that people are not expecting. <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, joking aside, um, I'd like to uh, go back to Gary, because uh, as the first uh, SFC licensed uh, digital assets uh, training platform in Hong Kong, obviously you guys have been you know, opening for business, serving clients, and I just want to get an update from you. So what are the sort of latest uh, focus uh, in serving clients from OSL, uh, both in Hong Kong as well as overseas? And also, the, any suggestion besides the, the views that you just mentioned? Uh, what, what are the things that uh, Hong Kong can do, maybe US Hong Kong can do uh, to help further accelerate the growth of the digital assets uh, ecosystem going forward? Thank you, King. Uh, may, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, address your questions in sort of reverse order. Um, so on the, um, on the point about accelerating the growth of digital asset ecosystem in Hong Kong, I, I think maybe a number of sort of general high level observations first. I, I think I think the journey from zero to one has already been been undertaken and and frankly, I, I think I think we've done well. And uh, you know I, I would say probably the hardest part of the journey. Um, but I think now now we need to look at um, how to bring uh, uh, you know once again sort of the issue of critical mass. And, and maybe sort of just just look a little bit deeper into into what that means um, and and I think to you know we can we can use blockchain as a, as a comparison um, blockchain protocols you, you can you can be the the smartest most intelligent and most sort of you know gold-plated protocol um, on the planet but if there's no one using it if there's no one using the protocol it doesn't grow um, and if it doesn't grow then that means no vendors are going to to write uh, solutions for it. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of uh, coders looking out for bug fixes, um, and generally, uh, it's it's not going to be very useful. And so, I think the issue of um, uh, you know how to how to facilitate the growth of the of the ecosystem in Hong Kong, um, you know, if we want people to use it. The first thing to do is to make sure people know about it and they understand it. Um, and, and, and I think that th this will naturally lead me to, to sort of answer the other, the other part of your question. So for example, um, a lot of investors um, or, or even a lot of new entrants, when they, when they come across digital assets, when they come across a, a new token or, or they come across a new NFT, um, all of a sudden, some of their usual common sense from traditional finance um, sort of gets gets put into the in, into the background. Um, you know, all the stuff, all the risk questions you would usually ask as an investor. All of a sudden, some people um, you know do do have a habit of forgetting those. So, um, classic example: ring fencing of client assets against insolvency of operators. 
in traditional finance, when you deal with someone, the first question you look at is counterparty risk. Um, and how do you determine these sorts of things? Well, you look for things like audited financial statements, um, uh, you know, effectively an objective source of transparency. Um, you know, these are cornerstone for investor protection, as well as cornerstone for risk managers to look after, to, to, to look after, uh, you know, to, to, to look after their clients and to look after, look after their, their investors. So, so therefore it goes back to, if we want people to enter the game, it's important to not neglect the importance of information by educating the investors, educating the operators, educating the international community so that they understand it. So they understand why um, uh, it's in their self-interest to, 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 uh, to enter the picture. So, you know, we definitely want uh, uh, the Hong Kong regula uh, regulatory regime and Hong Kong ecosystem to be, to be of the highest quality. And I, truly, and I truly do think that. I'm not just saying that to, you know, to please the audience. Um, and, but we also want the Hong Kong regime to be used by more participants, operators, investors, vendors, service providers, professional advisors, et cetera. No, it is not a popularity contest. And we certainly don't believe in the race to the bottom, um, either globally or regionally. But for a sector which is highly global, you know, rapidly evolving and constantly flooded with sort of 24 seven um, uh, information and development, we cannot neglect the importance of educating the audience. Um, and not just about the substance, but also why it should matter to them from a self-interest perspective. So we have, to, we have to start informing investors and the international community why it is in their interest to know, why it is in their interest to participate in the regulated space. You know, for example, I mentioned uh, regulatory arbitrage earlier on. That's not just a Hong Kong phenomenon. That's, a, that's an international phenomenon. So, you know, we have to educate the good quality investors or, or investors generally why it is in their interest to be in the regulated space. And in doing so, we are effectively also informing the, um, the, the, the operators community why it's in their interest to also be in the regulated space to, 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 provide, um, to, to, pr to provide service at a higher standard. Um, so, you know, and, and, and the contrast is that, um, as, you know, same thing for operators and investors is, it's the, it's the contrast of being in it as opposed to doing everything to be outside of it. So in the longer run, um, you know, the, in doing so, um, we, we should be fostering more resources coming into the space so that, so, so that we can actually help the ecosystem to grow. So I, I think, you know, to, to, to come back to the first part of your question then, um, you know, what, what, what are, you know, what, what are the, the, the needs of uh, clients in Hong Kong and overseas that we're seeing um, in the last, uh, for example, in, um, in the last year or so, um, I would definitely say, um, especially among the regulated investor space, um, you know, regulated custody, regulated and transparent um, uh, platform arrangements, um, audited uh, arrangements, these are very, very key to, to the international institutional investor community. So, so ho hopefully I've sort of answered your question in a sort of very roundabout sort of way. Well, I uh, think one thing that I can uh, commit to you, uh, Gary, uh, and also the broader digital assets uh, ecosystem is that uh, at least on our part, Invest Hong Kong, we'll definitely uh, do more of these uh, kind of sessions to basically spread, spread the words. I mean, I, I won't say that it's education, because obviously a lot of investors in Hong Kong are very savvy. We just feel that it's important for us to have the information parity, that we get the, the most late, the latest information out so that uh, everybody are uh, making investment decisions and well informed. Now, um, I guess the, the next uh, part I would like to uh, tap, tap into will be uh, Alasio. Now, so the, obviously, I, again, I'm asking questions almost on behalf of some of the investors who are still in so early, early innings in understanding the space. So let me ask you a very basic question. So does has trust buy insurance to protect the things that you're protecting others? And also, so how does it work in terms of what other extra level of protections are you providing to the customers? All right, thanks for your question. Well, let, let, me, uh, let me answer your question directly first and, may, and, and then elaborate a little bit further. Um, yes, the answer is, of course, we do have insurance and we have a, an extensive coverage uh, that covers both the species and the crime risk 
uh, up to 110 million dollars US dollars right now for those that are not familiar with the, uh, the difference between uh, specie and crime risk um, specie is more focused around the physical and transportation uh, aspect of the asset that you want to cover or protect while crime is a broader and consequently more expensive coverage that also includes aspects related to uh, cybersecurity, which are obviously very critical for companies operating in the virtual asset space. Um, now, so um, I think this is kind of the one of the basic requirements in 2022. Uh, all of the institutional grade custodians comply with a with the insurance requirement, but uh, the interesting part is is that basically as of today, custodians have to comply with much more uh, than this, and insurance is just really the the, the starting point. So other aspects that if I um, if I was on the other side of the fence as an investor, I would look at is obviously audit, right? Whether the company has been audited by a uh, but one of the big four, for example, I would look at uh, certifications such as SOC 1, SOC 2, uh, ISO. These are very extensive uh, uh, processes to, to obtain these certifications. And certainly there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of paperwork to go through, but it also gives a, a very high level of uh, governance and discipline within, within the company that I would like to see in institutional grade custodians. Uh, I would like to see penetration tests uh, not done by a uh, unknown company, but done by first year uh, cybersecurity companies and done at uh, regular intervals. So, for example, every three months or at least uh, after every uh, big upgrade or release of the of the platform. Right. And finally, but obviously uh, not less importantly, uh, I would look at the positive scrutiny and uh, regulatory licenses that are obtained by, uh, by leading regulators in the space. Right? At the end of the day, we went through the process with a number of regulators now, and um, most of them have become really um, ex experts really in, the, in this area and are able to actually really understand, uh, since they talk to most of the players in the space, they're really able to understand whether you already have that level of maturity of processes and procedures, uh, not only on paper, but also in the implementation of, uh, to actually to, uh, to be granted a license. Great, uh, Alessio, thank you so much. Again, this is exactly the kind of feedback we're looking for in this kind of uh, webinar forum is to provide investors with a peace of mind to perhaps get in a space that they may not be familiar with. But, but now that this is uh, becoming mainstream, uh, it's, it's great to know that there are some professionals like has trust in the market to basically safeguard them. Now, um, Professor Wang, now, so uh, I understand that uh, you are such a passionate uh, a person in the crypto space that you also founded the uh, Crypto FinTech Lab at HAUST. Now, and obviously you work with a lot of uh, very progressive-minded professionals in this space. Now, so what's your vision uh, uh, for Hong Kong? Of course, just now you shared uh, some of the views. So, but if you were to sort of uh, focus on not just Hong Kong, but the role that Hong Kong can play uh, in the bigger context of China. So can you shed uh, some lights in terms of uh, how we can excel to be a useful partner in the so China or even the broader like better road, the, 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 uh, the ASEAN market, the ASEAN and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Kim. Ac actually, just a few days ago, word on the street in Hong Kong is uh, not not uh, in, in Shanghai that a large number of international financial firms are uh, planning to relocate their Asian headquarters to Singapore. Uh, to me, it's uh, actually a very disturbing news, okay, uh, if it turns out to be true. But I would like to ask a bigger question, that is, why Singapore, not Hong Kong? I think if we start to ask this question, we will uh, be able to see some 
some of the solutions that's ahead of us. Okay, so again, I want to address your question from two points. Okay, on uh, two points. Uh, the 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 first point is globalization. So many of us have seen signs of retreat from uh, many countries, especially the Western Bloc, uh, from uh, globalization. Okay, so. Uh, there have been uh, various speculations that uh, the world economy will be taking a U-turn, okay? But if I were the Chinese government, I, I would be uh, seeing it slightly differently. I would be seeing that uh, uh, there was an effort by various countries and various blocs, especially in the Western power, to establish a new globalization order that excludes China, okay? Like, uh, given that China is actually the biggest beneficiary of globalization in the last 30 years or so, it's critical, uh, if I, you know, from a Chinese government point of view, it's critical for China to continue globalization as we know it today. Okay? Uh, there is going to be extreme challenges, okay? Yet the solution, in my view, is right in front of China, okay? It is to uh, really develop digital economy as uh, uh, because digital economy is a true global economy, okay? No country, okay, or no power, uh, or no country can be denied participation by any other country, politically, diplomatically, and militarily. So by embracing a blockchain-based digital economy such as the metaverse, NFT, uh, DeFi, et cetera, okay? China will, uh, strategically be well positioned to continue its economic growth for years to come. Okay? And this can be also can be said about you, uh, other countries like US. In fact, a recent survey even show Africa is uh, moving aggressively to adopt uh, cryptos, for example. Okay, so uh, my second point, I mean, relating to what you just mentioned is uh, Hong Kong's unique role under the one country, two systems. Currently, the Chinese government is still exploring a balance between growth and security. Among the concerns, for example, capital flights and financial regulation and many others. Yet, many of the major concerns, I would argue, you know, for, for China, does not extend to Hong Kong. For example, capital flights, in my view, is not a major concern for Hong Kong. So what does that mean? This actually gives Hong Kong a unique opportunity to be an extremely valuable bridgehead and perhaps a sandbox to explore and experiment, to be a policy and regulation trailblazer as we've been talking here, and to be the most exciting, in my view, the incubator for new ideas and projects. Okay. So yet Hong Kong at this time has been slow in taking advantage of this position. We're ceding our advantages voluntarily to other players such as Singapore, Dubai, and uh, you know, imagine how Singapore is feeling these days. And going back to my previous remark about the words in street in Hong Kong, I, I saw the, 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 the posting, the message, and the headline was, uh, Singapore is counting money while lying down. Okay, so Singapore Tang just Fu Chen. Okay. Uh, so I, I think we must inject a sense of urgency into the, the, uh, uh, the Hong Kong government. Okay. Finally, you know, let me, you mentioned the Hong Kong uh, uh, UST, uh, the, the crypto fintech. I, I know, you know, for university, our role is uh, quite limited, you know, what we can play. Uh, however, we should still be forward looking, in my view, to prepare for the day when all pieces finally fall in place. Okay, so uh, at HKUST and the, our lab, we have embarked on a, a couple of very strong educational initiatives. Uh, our goal is actually to nurture young people to be the leaders in the era of digital economy. So our students are not just learning from classes, but they're also putting, uh, being put on projects and blockchain and digital assets. So change, I think, will take time, but education, talent, nurturing should never stop. I hope, okay, so my hope is every uh, audience uh, of this uh, particular forum uh, will be able to contribute in their own ways to keep the wheel spinning. Okay, th thank you, Professor. Um, I've been uh, looking at the chat box. Uh, I look like a long stream of questions and I would like to take this opportunity to address some of them. Uh, and um, okay, the first one would go to uh, Elizabeth. 
the question from the audience is, uh, okay, is an issuance of tokens by a private company regulated by the SFC? Right. Um, in relation to um, issuance of tokens, um, the, uh, the SFC's approach is generally to regulate intermediaries. And um, in re um, we generally do not regulate issuance unless it is an offer to the public. So um, when I when I say um, we regulate intermediaries, for example, once you issue the tokens of a private company, you do not distribute it or offer it to the public. But for example, you might um, find an intermediary to help you distribute those tokens, then we would regulate the inter intermediary distributing the tokens as those tokens would be security tokens. And would then um, the act of distributing the tokens would then become dealing in securities under the um, SFC's regulatory regime. So we will regulate the intermediation. Great, I think this is very clear. <laughs> um, now, the other question is also for Elizabeth. So what is the SFC's current approach to and guidance of regulation of uh, VA-based OTC derivative products given the ongoing developments of the OTC derivative regime? Right, um, actually the SFC recently has received a lot of inquiries in relation to um, VA based um, OTCD products. Um, this perhaps may be um, what Gary mentioned that um, we've, um, Hong Kong has had three years of training. So now traditional financial services are looking into um, expanding their, um, their business into the VA space. Um, um, right now, um, we are very open to understand what um, the industry um, proposes to do in relation to um, VA based OTC derivative products. So um, um, I would ask um, any firms interested in um, going down um, this um, business um, route um, to um, directly contact their case teams to discuss and we can look into um, what further guidance um, we may need to um, issue to the industry in relation to these products. Great, uh, let me see. Wow, this is a long one, let me take a look. Okay, so again, uh, I said, okay, thank you for the speakers, very helpful information. Now we got, okay, the, the question is, we got many clients inquiries about VA related initiatives. Some wants to increase that 10% of virtual asset exposure. And some wants to launch VA funds and give more F FAQ that can be issued on such as RO requirements or some questionnaire issue for the applicants to promote, to provide details to the commission in the standard formats that will help streamline a bit the process. Uh, or even some, okay. So basically, I think this is a uh, question and perhaps some suggestion. So uh, any views, uh, Elizabeth? Right, um, well, um, we, we started um, regulating virtual asset fund managers um, start um, back in 2018 and 2019. So, um, We've been learning through the process and um, we, we are also looking into um, how to streamline the process, um, whether to pro um, provide further guidance in relation to this, um, this um, business model. So um, um, we would be happy to continue our dialogue with the industry to learn um, where perhaps there may be pain, pain points and then we could address them and see how we could streamline the process and also issue more guidance. <laughs> Great. Uh, I see there's a question. This is uh, for us at Hong Kong. <laughs> the question is, uh, my client is launching an NFT marketplace next month in Hong Kong. We found it uh, very difficult to find a local bank to open a bank account from a client. Is there something you know, Hong Kong can help? Um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a long answer. The strict on, the, I, I don't have a strict, easy answer because this is the kind of question we talk to many of our banking uh, colleagues as well, not, not colleagues, but banking partners. Uh, and um, obviously some banks are more pro progressive minded than the others. Um, I think it's something that I'll probably need to take an offline view. So I would uh, just um, type in my email in the, in the chat function so that you can drop me an email and I'll get my colleague to try to uh, help you um, by taking this offline, okay? All right, now I think uh, since we have uh, been, we got quite, quite a lot of questions, but at the same time, we are running the close to the time for this webinar. Now, um, obviously this is, uh, as I mentioned before, we recognize that this is a very exciting space, digital assets and all the latest developments. Uh, this is intended to be just the beginning of an ongoing 
sharing of uh, the most updated information. And uh, we would also like to collect uh, more feedback from the, from the uh, industry uh, players. So continue to just uh, send messages to us. You can easily find myself on LinkedIn or drop me an email, which I send to the chat box. And then once we consolidate those uh, information, uh, if there are more information uh, that you would like to, to clarify with, for example, like Elizabeth and the team, uh, we'll also organize another webinar to share the more uh, question or more, I would say, latest insight, if you will. Now, at the same time, uh, uh, please mark a calendar. In the next uh, few weeks and months, there will be, uh, for example, I believe it's the last week of May, there will be the blockchain events that we are collaborating in promoting the BSN, the Blockchain Service Network, which is a very important development for the sort of broader adoption of blockchain. Uh, we have another upcoming uh, event about uh, NFT uh, specifically that uh, we are now still finalizing the, uh, I think the final roster of the speakers and some of them are the, the uh, industry giants that have been in this space for quite some time that uh, are willing to share these investment uh, experience with us. So stay tuned. We have uh, many more of these webinars related to digital assets coming. And last but not least, I just want to thank all our speakers today for sharing your valuable time and also the great insights to our audience and also the support organizations for helping us to invite the guests uh, to join this uh, session. But again, this is not the end. This is just the beginning. So stay tuned. We'll be uh, sharing more info with you very soon. Thank you so much. Okay, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye-bye.